Jaden Cardell is his holder. Snap away. The hold is down. And the kick by Colby Sessoms is sailing. It splits the uprights. It is good. Sam Houston with zeros on the clock. And finally, and I mean finally, put this one to sleep. Welcome to the Behind the Mic podcast. Today's guest, voice of the Sam Houston Bearcats, Carlos Zimmerman. And now, here's your host, Jordan Smith. Hey there, once again, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of the Behind the Mic podcast. Got a special one here for you today. But before we get into what's happening on this episode, don't forget to follow, subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to, whether it be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or on YouTube Music as well. There is also a Q&A portion and a poll question in the Spotify app on this episode. So if you're listening on Spotify, fill out the Q&A and vote on the poll as well. So that way we can, you know, maybe get to those responses, those questions, and, and maybe answer a few of those on next week's episode. But for today's episode, we have our first guest on the podcast. He is the voice of the Sam Houston Bearcats and... One of my protégés, because I will always claim that as long as time persists, in <laughs> Mr. Carlos Zimmerman. Carlos, welcome to the podcast. Appreciate you having me, Jordan. So, first things first, just run with run through the the story of how you got here, from the very start of it to us sitting in this room right now. Well, where do I even begin? Uh, and don't worry, we have all the time in the world. Oh, I know we do. <laughs> we have all the time in the world. And that, that's always the case. But no, you know, it really all started. Uh, really, if you want to go to the bare bones of it, I don't talk about this very often, but, you know, I, I in high school, I played sports. I played football. I played basketball. Uh, I dabbled in baseball. I ran track. But I, 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 I was an athlete at one point. I know if you look at me today and you're like, how eh, was he an athlete at one point? But... No, but it started in high school. But my senior year, you know, my, my school, I went to a tiny private school in West Houston. And uh, I got hurt my first game of senior year playing football, hurt my back. And so th- I had to sit on the bench for a little while while I recuperated. And they asked me, instead of just sitting on the bench, like, hey, do you want to go up to, like, we had this little, like, deer stand thing on the back of the high school uh, facing the football field. And it was like, do you want to just go up there and film? And I'm like, yeah, I can do that. But then my coach was like, you know, you have a good voice. You should, like, I don't know, broadcast the game from behind it. And I was like, okay, let me give this a try. Because, you know, I mean, I had shown interest in broadcasting at that point. But then I started doing it, and it was only people that ever saw the uh, clips and whatnot were, uh, you know, the guys in film sessions. And uh, they said they enjoyed it, and they said I they felt like I had a future in it. And so that really is where I got my start in broadcasting, even though it wasn't really broadcasted. Right, right. But then uh, as time went on, I graduated high school in 2016, went on to college, did uh, three semester or three years at uh, Lone Star College, um, and just uh, went through my basics there and didn't really do a whole lot of broadcasting, just trying to get my basic classes done. But I knew when I transferred out, that was going to be the focus. And, well, that led me to Sam Houston. <laughs> I don't recommend this to anybody listening to this, but uh, I only applied to one school to transfer to. Instead of multiple, I decided on Sam. That was my That was my only option at that point. So I transferred, moved here to Huntsville, and uh, started getting involved in the mass comm department my first semester there. You know, I met you and I met our other friends and uh, I just went on from there, started doing games on our campus station, 90.5 uh, KSHU The Cat. Uh, did a lot of volleyball to start and then started getting some basketball. And then the world came to a screeching halt in the spring of 2020 because of COVID. So it really took sports opportunities away through the summertime and then really into the fall, too, because Sam didn't play in the fall of 2020 any sport. Uh, They decided to cram 17 sports into the spring semester that year. Got to do a little bit of Alpha Omega uh, football in that fall of 2020. It was the only thing we could do. But then uh, that opened the door to be able to be hired uh, at KSAM. Uh, Both you and I hired around the same time. And 
Uh, I just remember sitting in our former operations manager, Steve Ricks, office, and he asked me, I was like, what is it you want to do? And I was like, I want to be a broadcaster one day. And he was like, well, I feel like I can help make that happen. So we worked closely together, worked closely with uh, my predecessor, Rob Hip, and then... You know, time went on. We got to do Huntsville girls basketball, Huntsville Lady Hornets softball. And that just was the kind of thing that kept evolving. The big thing was continuing to get opportunities and reps and stuff like that. I was still doing 90.5. I basically became the de facto voice of Sam Houston Volleyball on student radio because I was the only one that would do the games because uh, nobody else wanted to sign up for it. But uh, that gave me a love for that sport. And then time would go on and on. I started doing sideline for not just the Hornet football team, but uh, for Sam Houston a little bit as well. Uh, But then we get to the spring of 22, and uh, things really drastically changed after that. I had a big shift in my personal life and then uh, was kind of figuring out, all right, where am I going to go from here? I graduated in the fall of 21 with my bachelor's. I was through one semester of doing my master's program just so I could stay employed with the university. But... Then really, you know, God opened up a big door. Uh, Rob decided to leave and move on to North Dakota State. And I put my name in the hat to do the radio for Sam Houston. And uh, they took a chance on a 24-year-old that was fresh out of college. And, uh, well, that really brings us to today because really the rest of that was history, getting to do not only Sam Houston sports for the last couple of years, but doing Hornet sports uh, over the last couple of years as well. And it's been a whirlwind ride, to say the least, uh, from... Uh, an 18-year-old sitting in the back, sitting in a deer stand at the back of an old uh, private school, high school, to now being the radio voice for uh, now group of five uh, university, FBS university in Sam Houston. It's been crazy. Kind of looking at that a little bit, uh, especially your your college days, just kind of looking about how how much did your your experience in college, whether it be the Sam Houston experience, the high school stuff you did while in college, any of that stuff you did as far as your play-by-play goes, how much did that help you kind of prepare and get ready for what ended up eventually coming after college? Well, I mean, it laid the foundation for one thing, uh, just to learn the fundamentals of uh, play-by-play. Because I, I, when I was a, when I was a student and doing student radio, I would rarely ever flip to the color side, to color commentary side. I just it it didn't suit me. I know you know typically at the national level and in most cases a color analyst is a former athlete who understands the sport having played it. Now I did play sports, and so the best sport I feel like I could do color with was basketball because that was my sport since I was age five. But uh, play by play just gravitated to me for multiple reasons. One, I love to talk. If you can't tell, uh, two in radio you have nothing but uh, time to be able to fill when you're on radio, whether it be football, basketball, or baseball. So gave me an opportunity to be able to branch into my skills, especially in my college days. Um, I feel like the big catalyst, and you know this very well, the spring of 21, uh, getting my feet wet on big FM radio was doing that semifinal game against James Madison uh, for Sam Houston football. Uh, filling in for Rob that day, and uh, I think that really laid the foundation, and um, really uh, that was the catalyst, I think, ultimately in me getting the job uh, the year after uh, because of how I was able to just, and I'm not trying to pride myself here, but trying to, but just to be able to kind of go in there a little cold turkey, having a week to maybe prepare for that ball game, um, Having not been with the team most of the season, other than a couple of games here and there on 90.5, but that that really set the stage for what would come. And I think that being able to do that while still in college was a big boost to be able to be prepared for what would happen uh, over the next couple of years for sure. And you and I have talked about this plenty of times because... I was on the other side of the stadium doing it on student radio, as I was pretty much that whole playoff run and pretty much every single home game, I think, except for one that season. But, you know, as I said and as multiple people said, I told you as well, that game alone was going to be the game that got you your job. That was basically your breakout game. Everybody has their breakout game. uh, But in the moment when you were calling that game, did it feel like, you know, were, were you kind of like, I hope I'm doing a good job, or was it just more of, 
I hope Sam can do something out of it. And then, of course, you saw the, what, 28-point comeback or whatever it was to take the lead and run away with it. Kind of what were you thinking at all about, you know, oh, hey, you know, I did this call was pretty good. Maybe that'll go on a reel or something. Or was it just kind of just kind of trying to live in the moment? I was really, to be honest with you, I didn't think anything was going to come out of it. I just, I was thankful for the opportunity to be able to do that ball game, a game of such a huge scale. I mean, you look at the history of Sam Houston. They had only been to the FCS championship twice and lost both times to North Dakota State. And this has really been one of the first times since 2017 that the Bearcats were in a position to be able to get back to Frisco. And so I knew it was a huge game, so I did put a lot of prep time behind it. But at the end of the day, I was just going to go there, do my job that I've been asked to do, and see how it goes from there. And I never once envisioned that, yeah, that would be the reel I would send off to be given the job to do Sam Houston full-time on the radio. Um, In that moment, I just wanted to live in the moment (laughs) because it's not very often that you get to experience something of that grand scale while you're a student in college. Not many people can say, yeah, I was there when they won the national championship. I was there for the... uh, 27 point comeback and being down by 17 points in the third quarter with like four minutes left and you have the lead at the end of it i was and to say i was there i mean that's something i'm gonna tell the grandkids one day and like hey you look at that yeah i was in the press box that day calling the game so that's really all there was to it and like i said i never would have thought that that was going to be a benchmark moment in my career and it forever will be and it's funny because you know we talk about it, of course something that is kind of lost, I think, on younger broadcasters, especially, you know, whenever you are trying to get started or at least thinking about wanting to get started. It's like, yeah, you got to balance between school and stuff as well. You have these great moments, and then all of a sudden, you're back in biology, or you're back in English, you're back in, you know, whatever, specialized writing, whatever it is, the next day, probably with the starting quarterback. So <laughs> it's it's kind of a weird dynamic in that scenario, you know, being a college student to get, get, to, get to do this. I mean, already just alone, college student or not, not a lot of people get to have those kind of opportunities, whether it's you know calling the FCS playoffs or the national championship, you know getting to do uh, a bowl game, March Madness, the NCAA baseball tournament, uh, getting to do you know professional playoff game, what professional in general, whatever the case may be. Not a lot of people that get to have that. So having that experience in in college was, had to have been pretty cool for you. You know, of course, like I said, I was on the other side, but. Not nearly as cool as what you were doing, because I was just on the little old campus radio station, little old 90.5 KSHU, but you actually getting to do it on the official FM partner uh, at the time for Sam Houston Athletics. Yeah, that was that that was that was a big opportunity. I remember when you first came to me and were like, "Hey, um, I'm I'm doing this on on KSHU." Like, what? What what do you mean, sir? What do you mean you're calling the semifinal of the FCS with Dave Pash hypothetically in the next booth over because? They were doing that game remotely, unfortunately. But an ABC game, you're sitting in the Sam Houston booth. That crazy. <laughs> yeah. And I'll always thank uh, Rob's Rob Hip's brother for that because that's what pulled Rob away <laughs> that day was uh, he had to officiate his brother's wedding. I mean, he says Rob says to this day that he was thankful that he could be there with his brother, but he wished that he could have been there for that incredible moment. But, uh, you know. Yeah, no, forever thankful for it and never taken that opportunity for granted. Uh, it was that was that was it was a blast that day, and like I said, it's a benchmark and a cornerstone of my career. I won't soon forget. Before we kind of get into post getting hired, we you know when we were talking about right after you got hired, we kind of started looking around the 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 Western Athletic Conference, and then of course Sam Houston was announced to go to Conference USA, so started looking around that as well and kind of looking at all around Division One, and we kind of started to notice something that before you headed into your first ball game, you were definitely the youngest in the Western Athletic Conference, going to be the youngest and currently are the youngest in Conference USA, and one of, if not, you know, part of the few youngest in all of Division One football, FCS or FBS, that are an official team hired voice of the school was there going into that. Cause you know, you were hired at 22 basically. Yeah. I believe 22. Yeah. 24, 24. There you go. So going into that, was there any kind of pressure that you felt early on getting into that start of Holy cow. I just graduated 
eight months ago, and I'm putting on a headset as the voice of the school I graduated from. Oh, I mean, I mean yeah, there, there's obviously a lot of pressure that came with it because, you know, obviously, like I, like we alluded to earlier in the JMU game, I didn't feel any pressure whatsoever. I felt a little nervous at the beginning, but uh, once I got into the groove, I just went on from there. But once I was hired and I, I, I put a lot of thought into it, yeah, there were a lot of nerves behind it because I knew how historic not only the university was, and but the people that had came before me. Uh, I had huge shoes I needed to fill in my eyes. I did. I mean, I mean, you go Robin, but then you go before him, Cooter, um, a legend in Huntsville. And now I'm the one that's in his mantle doing Sam Houston and Huntsville at the same time. And it, it, it was it was a little scary to just jump right in and go figure. My first game as the voice of the Bearcats, Texas A&M, Kyle Field, one of the greatest locales in college football. And that's my first official game. You want to talk about a lot of pressure? That's a lot of pressure. We right won't there. mention what happened during the game. No, we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> Final score or the uh, five-hour break in between. Yeah, we don't, we don't need to talk about that. We got home late that <laughs> night. But but I will say it was, it, it was surreal once I stepped into it. But I knew that, look, <laughs> I, I said to myself, Carlos, this ain't student radio anymore. This is not this is not just a one-off game. This is your life now. This is your job now. Put a lot of work into it and I feel like I've done that over my 2 years doing Sam Houston football, men's basketball and baseball on the radio. I mean, my preparation has evolved uh, for these ball games, football. I I mean, as soon as uh the final whistle's blown on one game, I'm looking forward to the next opponent and seeing what they have to offer. Um and getting notes on them and stuff like that. But to answer your question in full, yeah, there was a lot of pressure because I, for pe- what people may not know about me is like I, I'm a big people pleaser. I, I care a lot about what people think. So internally, I put a lot of pressure on myself to, to put on a good show and do a good job. But then I realized what I was doing to myself. I was putting so much pressure on myself that even the little mistakes that would happen, it would eat at me for weeks on end and I would not forget about it. Well, one thing I learned this year is that mistakes are going to happen. You are, There is no such thing as a perfect broadcast. That is impossible to attain. You want to strive for perfection, obviously, but it's never going to happen. And then one thing you know that I learned, and this is something Jason Barfield taught me, um, listen to other broadcasters, whether it be national or just fellow colleagues uh, in the league. And notice that they're going to make mistakes as well. And some of them, even some big mistakes that make you feel a little better about yourself, realizing like, okay, even even some of the more established broadcasters over the years can make some mistakes. You know, this year I've gotten to meet, you know, legends of our business, uh, Art Haynes at Missouri State and Dave Nitz at Louisiana Tech, longtime guys in the radio business and sports at the college level and even they make mistakes still to this day so that's one thing that taught me this year and allowed to kind of take the pressure off and it and go back to those times of living in the moment but being prepared at the same time for whatever may come your way during the ball game so before we kind of move on and, and learn a little more about you here let's just get to know the basics about you because there's a large amount of people that I don't think realize, and this is something that we've gotten all all over the years, something that, you know, you've had to kind of contend with and be like, hey, this isn't true. You're Filipino. Yeah. Everybody thinks that you're Hispanic. Right. But you're actually Filipino. Yes. So, yes, I am Filipino. Contrary to popular belief, yeah, you look at my first name, you're like, oh, you're Mexican. Oh, you're like uh, Spanish or something like that. No, not even close. I mean... A lot of people say, like, you know, the Philippines, yeah, they were owned by Spain for 500 years. So that's why there's a lot of the you know, Spanish derivatives right. from their names. My grandpa on my mom's side uh, from the Philippines, his name is actually Carlos. That's where I got my name from. Uh, but, yeah, Filipino. Um, and going into this year, I am one of two with a Filipino descent that are... Division One broadcasters. There is one other one, and I kind of bombshelled it on him this year. And oddly enough, we are both in the same 
conference. Mm-hmm. AJ Ricketts at FIU. Shout out to him real quick. Um, he is the other Filipino. And go figure, the two Filipinos of Filipino descent that are calling games at the Division One level, go figure, they're both in Conference USA. So uh, that that was a crazy thing to learn about. Um, I, I When I went to Miami, I, I had to ask him, I was like, AJ, I just found you on Twitter. You're Filipino? And he's like, yeah, I am. And I'm like, well, I hate to bait. Because on his bio, it said the only Filipino-American FBS broadcaster. And I was like, AJ, I hate to burst your bubble, but I'm half Filipino. And he's like, dude, that's awesome. That's freaking awesome. So he changed his bio in that moment to say, uh, just have the American flag and the Filipino flag emojis on his thing. Um, because obviously we both share a nationality together so that was pretty cool but uh yeah let that be known people filipino <laughs> not hispanic i hope that quells all the room all all the uh n- n- what's the word for it the just the all rumors. the not maybe the rumors <laughs> i guess we can call it that we confusion can, the confusion that'll clear up any confusion although i think anyone i meet is still gonna think that oh hispanic no not even close Shout out to AJ Ricketts. It was a great track and field star during his days at, at Miami as well before yes. he ended up jumping over to FIU to to do a little work. I believe he also got a master's, I believe, and I, he did it at FIU or he did it at Miami, one of the two, and then he ended up starting broadcasting while in college at Miami at FIU yep. as well as Miami while doing track and field. And he's still doing track and field because I, I'm friends with him on Facebook and he went to the Philippines for a track event. And did really well out there. So he's still, you know, staying in great shape while uh, broadcasting. So that, 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 was, that was pretty cool to see. Uh, but yeah, shout out to him. Good dude. So those of us who know you, I, we know this answer that I'm about to, to ask you. To the, question, the answer to this question. Out of any sport, at any level of competition, what is your favorite and why is it college basketball? <laughs> I mean, obviously, I said earlier in this show, I, I loved basketball. So I played it since I was age five and up and through my senior year of high school before I got hurt playing basketball my senior year. Uh, tore up both my knees playing it. Uh, but I just gravitated to it at a young age. But then as I got older and I got into high school, I started paying attention more to college basketball. Because this was at a point where, you know, I, I grew up a Rockets fan. And this is a point where the Rockets were okay but not great they're on the back end slotting down yeah uh to where they're at now um but they're on the up that's a story for another day but um but i started watching college basketball intently especially the ncaa tournament in 2012 um i i gravitated to it because my youth pastor at the time at church uh, he's a liberty alum and uh, liberty was making a run they were in the big south at the time before this is long before they were in conference usa um, but they were making a run at it, and I just sat there watching the game, and I was just enthralled with how different college basketball was to the NBA because it still had that amateur feel to it. I, as a 14-year-old, didn't realize that at the time, now that I do, but watched it and just fell in love with the tournament at that point. And then from that point on, I just was glued to college basketball. If it was on, I'm watching it. And I, I I'm, I'm, I'm would say I, I like the faster sports, because I can rattle off a lot of stuff pretty quickly when I'm broadcasting, but there's just something great about the NCAA March Madness tournament. The fact that you can have most the most monumental of upsets that you may not see on a college football gridiron, or you may not. You well, I mean, we've been starting to see it at the college baseball level, but uh, but college basketball is in a league of its own when it comes to that. Just the pageantry of the tournament and the absolute fact that you could be duke as the number one team in the country but you could get knocked off by a real tiny school in midwestern new york in that that, that's what i love about the sport no other college sport really has that and that's what made me gravitate to it so much. So, yeah, that, and that's why I love it. And, I mean, come on. I grew up playing the NCAA basketball games on on, on Xbox and PlayStation. And, that, I mean, that, that's just what made me fall in love with it. And so it will forever hold that distinction. One of the ben- hopeful benchmarks of my career is hopefully one day calling a game at March Madness, whether that be with Sam Houston or something way down the line in the future. And so you've been, you've been close a couple of times, the last two years especially. Sam Houston has been pretty close and 
almost odds on favor both years to actually get to the dance. Yeah, they're 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 on the doorstep, but I, I on a side note of that, I'm excited for what Chris Mudge is doing at Sam Houston. They him and his staff have loaded the team up for 2024-25, so I really have a really good feeling about uh, Sam Houston men's basketball coming up the uh, coming up in the fall. Obviously a long way to go until we get there, but I'm really excited for uh, what he's got cooking up. We talked about this, you know, you and I have have been kind of the, the the veteran guys of the area when it comes to at least the younger generation of broadcasters helping to try to bring up, teach, and and everything with a lot of the younger talent that have come through the pipeline of Sam Houston State University uh, through the same student broadcast group that we went through, NSMA. Um, I guess kind of when did that shift kind of happen for you from Oh yeah, you know I am. I, you know I'm the young guy. You know whatever. Blah blah. I'm still learning. I'm still kind of new to this, which you still technically are. But when did when did that kind of switch happen? Going from I'm just the young guy learning from a bunch of people to I'm doing that, but I'm also now becoming a mentor to all of these other younger people who are coming in as well. I would have to say it was after I graduated and I was working through my masters in the spring of 22 because. I would do a lot of games at that time on, uh, I would do a few on ESPN plus, uh, for, for BSN. I would do just some games on BSN audio that we had at that time, um, uh, before, uh, we made the move. But when uh, one of my first games that I did in the spring of 22 was with one of our colleagues uh, and great friend, Luke Scott, um, he jumped on with me for a baseball game and it was a wild game. It was like, I think it was Sam Houston was playing McNeese or something like that, but it was a wild game. And I think that's at that point, me and Luke really bonded. Um, and we just, uh, and I, I feel, I realized that, uh, you know, th- this guy, he, I don't think he's going to want to go into broadcasting one day, but he obviously loves doing it now. But so let me try and see if I can mentor him up in a way. Um, you know, you and I kind of tag teamed with him and with Colin or uh, Colin Neal, another one of our colleagues, um, really tag teamed on really trying to mentor those guys up into good broadcasters. And that's when I think I realized like, okay, I've been at this for three years now. I'm still learning myself, but I can now give myself the opportunity to be able to pour into younger broadcasters that either just want to enjoy it while they're in college, like Luke, or maybe they want to do it for a career like Colin. So I would say two years ago, that's really when it blew up. And look what it turned into. Luke was my broadcast partner for Lady Hornet Softball at Huntsville for three years. And Colin's done Huntsville baseball for the last couple of years. And he's he did Sam Houston women's basketball home games this year. I mean, you just look at how far those guys have come. And you see all that. And deep down inside of you, you just feel that payoff like I had a part in their success. And that, that was a, it's a big part of it for sure. That's me with you. So, uh-huh. <laughs> would you say I'm your greatest success story? In the realm of play-by-play, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Um, I've I've mentored some other people in some other different areas. Uh, a guy that I mentored in in sports writing, uh, who ended up being in Nashville, I believe. He was a sports editor at one point. He's now doing live production with a different company. Uh, there's a guy who I met and bonded with early on in my career who's now doing, I believe, high baseball in, in minor leagues uh, or double A in the Cleveland Guardian system, I believe, or the Dodger system. It's one of two. He's kind of flipped over the last well, couple of years. But... Lest we forget, uh, you were a big reason to Colton Foster's success. Yeah, I convinced Help. him to, to sneak his way into the school newspaper. <laughs> and now he's the sports editor for the Huntsville item. Which is so. funny because, and hopefully we'll get him on the podcast one day and we'll, we'll tell this story more with him, but... Uh, he was a guy who, when I talked to him, I said, okay, so what are you wanting to do? He initially said, I want to do radio. I want to do podcasting. I said, great. You're going to be a sports writer. I need you to write me two to three stories a week. <laughs> <laughs> and then an occasional game game recap. I was like, but I don't want to. Like, well, this is what I, I got. This is what I need right now. I'll, I'll get you I'll get you in radio. I'll get you in podcast. I, this is what I need right now. And he ended up doing it. And, well, the sky's the limit from there. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, he fell in love with it for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, so this is something also that when talking about the younger generation of broadcasters, something that I think you and I definitely, it took us a little bit to kind of understand the importance of it is prep work. You know, I, it's something that I didn't really catch on to till about maybe two and a half years ago was, or at least I say two and a half years ago, more like three and a half 
was really getting deep into actually starting to try and make print, you know, do prep notes, make, you know, roster boards and, and try to actually game plan before games instead of just showing up, printing off the, the stats for the season, the last game, grabbing the roster, memorizing those and just kind of going from there, you know, actually sitting down during the week and kind of, you know, prepping for that with that thought, how, I don't want to say how important, but I guess how much has you starting to to do first off, when did when did that kind of click for you in your career? But also how much has that helped you when it comes to to uh raising your 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 level of, of where you are in, in your commentary uh and kind of helping to propel you and make it sound a little bit better, sound more fluid and sound a little bit easier more pleasant just be a more enjoyable experience for not only for you but also for the listeners at home it really hit me probably my last semester of my undergrad at sam houston i was still just doing student radio at that point but i think i had like one bad game and i looked at it and i was like man i really didn't prepare myself for that one did i, I kind of just went into that one cold turkey and see how I could do with it. It was probably a volleyball game or actually it may have been a basketball game actually, but that's when I realized, okay, maybe I need to start taking this preparation thing more seriously. So, um, I emailed our, uh, I had the next game I had to do was a men's basketball game on student radio. So I emailed our men's basketball SID Cody Stark. Um, and I said, Hey, can you send me the game notes whenever you get them? And he was like, really? And I'm like, yeah, I would like the game notes. And he's like, okay, yeah, sure. And then I, I, I sat down about two days before and I was just flipping through all his notes, highlighting stuff that were that were going to be some key points for the ball game. Um, you know, looking at the roster up and down, making sure I got pronunciations down right, um, looking at stats, see if there was any milestones that was about to come up for some people. And then uh, at that point, I don't remember exactly which team they were playing. Uh, they weren't in conference play yet at that point, but. I, e I reached out to the opposing team's SID, and I said, hey, can you send me the game notes? And he's like, who are you? And I'm like, I'm a student. I do the student radio uh, for the campus station at Sam Houston. And he was like, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, I'll send them to you. And uh, I went through their notes. Did the same thing I did with Sam Houston. And when I went into that ball game, I think it was one of probably my best broadcasts as a student at Sam Houston. And from that point on, I was like, okay preparation is going to be key for the success of a broadcast and and that's not to say that there's been times where there's been some mess ups here and there even if I ha am fully prepared for a ball game because sometimes especially in the sport of basketball it's really hard to go flipping through notes when a ball game is going on because at that point you're just trying to worry about what's happening in the ball game and calling the action you you don't have a whole lot of time to think about some of the notes that you've set aside beforehand sometimes I'll just take the notes that are sent to me I'll copy and paste some stuff off of it put it on my own sheet so that I'm not sitting there with a 35 40 uh, page thing of game notes to flip through. Um, and that way I just have maybe a three to four page sheet of just the important stuff that's on there. Not to say that there's not important stuff in the game notes, but there's some that you just, you just won't use it. But preparation is paramount for the success of a broadcast. Not to only make you sound better and not sound like an idiot, but for the listener to understand and grasp what is happening in the ball game because especially with basketball and I, I harp on this a lot because football I have a color analyst I can bounce off of you know Brian Adams he, he great does a great job uh, with us doing football for Hornets and Bearcats but with basketball and baseball I'm by myself more often than not so I have to wear both hats of play-by-play -play and color at the same time obviously about 85% play-by-play 15% color during those broadcasts but Having those notes is a pure benefit so that it sounds better, the listener understands the game a lot better, and I feel like whenever I go into a ball game, having done more prep than I probably should have, it usually ends up being a good broadcast anyway. So, talking with Carlos Zimmerman here, the voice of the Sam Houston Bearcats on the Behind the Mic podcast, kind of talking about the prep work, and especially kind of digging into football, let's just kind of fast track. You're getting ready for the game against Rice on August 31st. What does that week leading up to that first Saturday of the season, that week one ball game down in Houston, what does that week look like day by day in regards to prep work and getting ready 
for a college football game, more or less, the season opener. So if it goes anything like it did this last season, Monday is going to be usually our press conference day uh, to sit down with uh, Coach Keeler, um, and just we'll just sit in a Zoom call. And uh, he'll give opening statements. Well, he'll field any questions that we have. But I'll usually do that. I'll sit in that press conference from Wood Forest because right afterwards I go into the studio and I do my pregame talk with him. We talk about, you know, just, you know, we'll, what we'll probably talk about is, you know, training camp, the spring, and just everything leading up to this ball game on Saturday. How are the players doing? How, is there anything y'all have changed up from the previous season in terms of, uh, you know, new coaching personnel that you've brought on and obviously new players that you've brought into the fold? So that really goes about eight, ten minutes long, depending on how long Keeler wants to talk. Um, and then from that point on, uh, I'll usually take that recording, I'll listen back to it, make a little edits here and there if I have to. I send it off to Barfield. He he uh, takes care of it and puts it into our rotation for the ball game on Saturday. Tuesday, um, that's when I'll really just start nailing down my prep work. Um, usually at that point, both teams have made their game notes available. So I'll print off game notes, I'll look through it, and then that's when I'll start making my two deeps. Now, if I have, now for those who don't know what a two deep is, it's just a, basically a roster. It's a depth chart, is what it is. You have your starters and your immediate backups on there of every position. It's an all 22 um in in football so i ha i have that there i put their stats on there that they had from well for this game it'll be from the previous season um and then i'll do that if the weather is good if it's not too hot and it's not raining i'll go out to football practice um whether it be tuesday morning or wednesday morning just to watch the guys in action because people may think like oh why are you wasting your time doing that they're just practicing like well this is what they're they're going to be put in situations in practice of what they're going to be put into in the game they'll do in game situations during practice so you got to see how they're going to react in practice and how that's going to translate to the ball game so that's a big part of going to uh, those practices and even then I'll do like maybe a little 2 3 minute talk with Keeler afterwards just to get his thoughts on practice and after a couple of days of having not talked to him, how does he feel now? Does he feel better, or does he feel a little bit more worse uh, going into a ball game? So that's usually how Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday looks. Thursday is a day of uh, finalizing notes, um, but at that, that point, usually I will call the opposing radio guy. So for for that Saturday, I'll call for that Thursday. I'll call JP and. Uh, We'll talk uh, about the ball game, get some insider information that we won't delve out until the ball game, um, and just uh, talk things over. Any you know hard pronunciations? Looking at Sam's roster right now, I don't think we're gonna have too many to worry about. But uh, that's how that'll look. Uh, Friday will be just the final touch up on notes and. More than likely, there's a Hornet game on a Friday before a Saturday, so I'll be trying to prepare for that as well. And then Saturday's game day. And then once the kick is, uh, once the ball is kicked off, and we're off and rolling at that point. I guess just kind of final thing before we get into uh, a new segment, rapid fire questions. Mm. Uh, not a new concept, but just a new segment. Uh, I guess if you had to kind of give a piece of advice to anybody listening who's either already in the game as a young broadcaster, uh, or maybe someone who's on the fence of whether or not they want to join or they absolutely want to join, they just don't know how to start or what to do in the beginning, they're a little nervous about getting started, whatever the case may be. You have any advice for those those young guns in, in the world of play-by-play? -play? Obviously, the big thing is you got to love sports to be able to get into this business. You have to love it. You can't just be like a casual. I mean, you, you could be, you couldn't really be a casual fan. Of sports, you have to have a deep love and understanding of the game to be able to succeed as a as a broadcaster. Because no one wants to listen to somebody who doesn't understand the game. There are many broadcasters, and I'm not going to name anybody by name, but there are many broadcasters out there uh, that uh, are just you know a casual fan listening that that enjoys sports that doesn't sound all that great because they're just casual about it. So obviously, having that love for sports, you need to have that. And the second thing is just you got you got to go out and search for opportunities. Um, going back to the fall of 20 before uh, me and Jordan got hired here at KSAM, um, you know, I, I, I had to go looking for opportunities because there wasn't a whole lot going on. And then I asked our professor, I was like, hey, do we have, is there any opportunities out there? And he was like, I don't know, but let me look. He reached out, 
and got the job here, and, well, the rest is history at that point. So seek opportunities. They are not going to just fall in your lap. And once you get those opportunities, make the most of it. Put a lot of effort into what you're going to do. Don't, you know, for lack of a better term, uh, don't don't half-ass anything because uh, because that's not going to get you anywhere. Just put the work into it. And the people that are the powers that be in your life and in your broadcasting life, they're going to see that and you will be rewarded for that. Doing that JMU game in 2021, I put a good amount of work into that ball game and look where it got me. So seek the opportunities and make the most of them. That's the best advice I could give to a young broadcaster. All right, let's go through our rapid fire questions. We got five of them. First four, kind of short, sweet to the point. The last one. You might be able to extend on a little bit before we end things here today. First one, are you a headset guy or are you a microphone guy? Headset, all the way. Headset? Headset. Uh, Any go-to pregame ritual, whether you're home, on the road, whatever, any kind of pregame ritual you have? Oh, man, pregame rituals. Um, (laughs) Me and uh, the public address announcer at uh, Sam Houston, Quentin Baylor, have this little thing of like, He'll always look back at me, and he always holds up a little cough drop uh, before uh, we go on the air, and he's like, you need it? And uh, some days I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to need that. Or other days I'm going to be like, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. But that's just a little fun thing me and him have. Um, Shout out to him. Great, great, great guy and does great work at doing PA for Sam. Um, Outside of that, I really don't – I really – I used to have a Dr. Pepper before – Every ball game until Jason Barfield taught me something. Uh, sugar coats your throat before a ball. Um, uh, if you have any sort of sugar and it's going to either make your voice crack a lot or you're going to have your throat be dry mid broadcast. Um, we've been talking here for about 40 minutes and I can feel it right now because I had a Dr. <laughs> Pepper about 10 minutes before this. There you go. Um, so I, I stopped doing that. But um, and just went strictly water, uh, room temperature water, by the way. Mm-hmm. That's the best way to go. Cold water could even dry your throat out even then some. Yeah. So, so yeah. but yeah, no really big pregame rituals. I'm just there. So I know you're not a, a, a guy who believes in superstition, <laughs> but is there anything that, you know, when a team's on a, a, a winning streak, when they're kind of playing hot in a, in a stretch, is there anything you do differently, you know, a routine you keep the same during that streak or you just kind of whatever i kind of just go in with the whatever feeling because like i mean just what they do on the court what i say on the air is not going to affect what they do on the court that's up or the field that's up to the players and the coaches i am strictly there just to call the action of what's happening so yes if the men's basketball team at sam houston's on a seven game winning streak i'm going to make mention of it but I'm not going to, you know, think like, oh, if I say this, oh, now they're going to lose. I don't believe in that. And you know that. But nothing really changes. I don't really change up my style. Uh, if they're on a winning streak, I just keep going as as is until until it's either over or I, I'm the basically the best way to say it. I'm the same from game one to game thirty five. Mm-hmm. Nothing changes. Is there any specific music that you listen to before games to kind of get you set in the mood mentally, kind of get ready for that, or you just kind of walk in and naturally it'll figure itself out? Uh, classic rock the whole way. Um, mm-hmm. Either it's, it doesn't matter, I just hit shuffle on my classic rock playlist and whatever happens, happens. And uh, usually more often than not, I've gravitated to a little, uh, the, the unofficial anthem of Sam Houston Athletics, Enter Sandman <laughs> by Metallica. Uh, that uh, That is a big one I listen to beforehand. Um, I listen to a lot of Tom Petty, a lot of uh, ACDC, Guns N' Roses, a lot of the hard stuff to just get me hyped up for a ball game. And I'll be the kind of guy, especially during basketball season, because I have the wireless earbuds in my ear and I'm just walking off with my equipment. And But I'll walk off the bus like a guy, like an athlete with headphones in, walking into the arena and uh, just bumping the music until I sit down to start set up all, setting up all my stuff. So that that if there's a pregame ritual, it's that is mm-hmm. coming off the bus with headphones in my ear bumping music as loud as I can as I enter the arena. And this last one, you can extend on a little bit to end the rapid fire, uh, as it'll be the last thing here before we end this episode here today on Behind the Mic. Of any sport, any level, is there a favorite story that you have from your your career so far? 
There's a lot, Jordan. There is a lot. Can I do two? I can. I can. You can do two quick ones. Two quick ones. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they both come from my first year of doing basketball for Sam Houston. Um, that would be the buzzer beater against Oklahoma. Uh, I mean, that being my first basketball broadcast as the voice of the Bearcats, and you knock off a perennial powerhouse in all of sports in col- at the college level. That was pretty dang cool. Uh, getting to do that game, voice cracks and all, mind you. Uh, but the second one, <laughs> this is going to go down as one of my favorites. So we're in Edinburgh, Texas, down in the valley. This is while the Bearcats were still in the whack. They were, we were playing UTRGV. Uh, we get to about midpoint of the second half. There's about 10 minutes left to go. And, you know, I start to feel like, oh, I need to kind of go to the bathroom. And I'm like, oh, we're up by 12. I think we're going to be okay. We're going to run away with this game. And then I'll be able to just, uh, I'll be able to hold it through post game and then be, just run to the bathroom after we're done. But the game continues to progress on, and here comes UTRGV. They start working their way back. As a matter of fact, I think you were producing for me that night. Um, And by about a minute left, we're tied. And I'm bursting at the seams at this point. I'm like, oh, man, this can't go to overtime or else something bad's going to happen. And Cameron Hoofner uh, hits a fadeaway baseline jumper at the buzzer to win the ball game and they all go crazy i'm going crazy that was such a cool one it was our second buzzer beater that year with the oklahoma one too and and i'm like okay i text uh who i it was either you or colin producing for me that night i don't know i was on site with you uh no this was away this was away oh away in, again in okay so you were That's i think right. you were producing yeah. from home uh so you were probably in your office and then i think either colin or luke was producing anyway i text him i was like i'll be back in four minutes let me go use the bathroom but it, no sooner than i look up from my laptop i'm sending that here comes jason hooten walking towards me to do our post game talk uh this was his last year at sam and i take the headset off and i'm like jason i love you this um i know this is such a huge win and you want to talk about it i'll be right back not in another word i'm zooming out of the gym finding a bathroom came back and then sat down we did the interview and everything the next day at the airport when we were going to fly back to texas this man's talking to just a random person maybe he knew them or whatever he was like yeah last night my freaking radio guy kind of left me out to hang for about five minutes and uh, after the ball game because we wanted to talk about it and, uh, and I'll never forget that to the end of my career because he basically threw me under the bus <laughs> for because I I did not manage uh, my, my bladder before uh, that second half when I definitely had a lot of time and halftime to be able to go take care of that so Never will forget that. Another note to broadcasters, halftime is your best friend. Tell your producer, give me an extra few minutes, and you'll be right back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it helps at the end. Absolutely. Where uh, where can people find you? Okay, you can uh, follow me, uh, Zimmerman, uh, I believe it's underscore PXP on X slash Twitter. Um, you can also follow me on Instagram, Zimmerman PXP, no underscore. Uh, friend me on Facebook. It won't be that hard to find me. Just search Carlos Zimmerman, and it will be more than likely a guy with a headset on. There's no other one out there, I can tell you that. You can friend me on Facebook. I'd uh, be happy to connect with you and give you uh, any tips or on broadcasting or stuff like that. Or if you just want to shoot the breeze on sports with me, I'm more than happy to do that. You can find me on LinkedIn at Carlos Zimmerman as well. I need to be more active on there, but uh, we're in the off season now, so there's no really point, but in the fall, I'm going to be more active on there as well. But yeah, that's where you can find me. Appreciate your time as always, Carlos. Thanks for uh, stopping by and being the the first guest of the podcast. Absolutely, Jordan. I appreciate you, man, and uh, looking forward uh, to uh, future episodes that I'll get to tune into. Yeah, follow follow this podcast, folks. It's a good one. That'll do it for this week's episode of Behind the Mic. Don't forget, you can follow us on social media. Pretty much everything is in the description. There's a few different discrepancies with name because of other podcasts taking the name. So go down in the description below and go find those social medias. As well, you can check out our Patreon page, my Patreon page, for extra exclusive behind-the-scenes content as well for my career for the podcast and stuff as well. Uh, And then don't forget, coming up next week, We will dive into the world of sports writing, what it takes to get started in that, what the whole career is all about, so on and so forth. Uh, And we'll just kind of delve into the world of the sports writer and how that's evolved throughout time as well. But again, that does it for us here this week on Behind the Mic. Again, special special thanks to the voice of the CMU Bearcats and Carlos Zimmerman for stopping by. Like you said, make sure you go follow him on all the social medias. And that'll do it. We'll see you next week for another edition of Behind the Mic. Eat them up, cats. Thanks for
for listening to the Behind the Mic podcast. Listen to every episode of Behind the Mic on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube Music. Open any of these apps and search Behind the Mic. Then hit the follow button so you won't miss a single episode, which release every Tuesday afternoon.